This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. How are you, Tanya? I'm doing okay today, Talia. How about you? I am doing splendid. Thank you for asking. Are you ready for today's story? I am, and I'm excited. Today, I'm going to talk about the kidnapping of a 12-year-old girl named Marion Parker. This story takes place in 1927, and at the time, Marion was 12 years old. Marion was born a twin. She has a twin sister named Marjorie Parker. And just so you know, Marion and Marjorie are not identical twins. Okay, so they were fraternal. They were fraternal, and they didn't look like each other. They looked like sisters, as you'd expect, but they were not twins. They were born to uh, Perry and Geraldine Parker. They lived in Los Angeles. Marjorie and Marion had an older brother named Perry Parker Jr. Perry Parker worked at First National Trust and Savings Bank, and he worked there for over 20 years. He was an officer i'm not exactly sure what that means but i think it's like a manager i'm assuming after yeah i 20 think years. so and geraldine was a stay-at-home mother marion was particularly close to her father and she would often go and join him when she could at the bank so everybody at the bank knew marion hanging out at the bank sounds like a blast hanging out with her dad she was like a daddy's girl Aww. more than marjorie marion was described as a tomboy she was a good kid She had a lot of friends, but she preferred to spend time with her family. She liked to play with trains and throw footballs while her twin, Marjorie, was more of a girly girl. On Thursday, December 17th in 1927, which happened to be Perry Parker's 40th birthday, the twins went to school as usual. In order for the twins to get to school, a streetcar, quote unquote, would pick them up and take them. I'm not exactly sure what that means. It's not a school bus, but it was called a streetcar. They would pick them up, take them to school, and then it would pick them up after school and take them home. What city was this? This is in Los Angeles. Okay. Around noon at Mount Vernon Junior High School, where Marjorie and Marion Parker were in sixth grade, a man entered the school and he approached Mary Holt, who's the school register. This man was described as about five foot eight inches tall. He was Caucasian. Age 25 to 30, he appeared to be well-educated, he spoke good English, and he wore a suit. This man went up to Mary Holt and explained to Mary that he worked at the bank with Perry Parker and that Perry Parker had been in an automobile accident and had very serious injuries. He told Mrs. Holt that Perry Parker was calling out for his daughter and had requested that this man go to school and get her. Mrs. Holt asks him, which daughter do you want? And he replies to her, the younger daughter. Oh, come on, really? And she says, oh, you mean Marion? He says, yes. Okay. Okay. Who is probably younger by a minute. And Mrs. Holt is just volunteering information. So Marion was pulled from her class at 1213 in the middle of the school Christmas party. She was asked to come to the office. When she got to the office, the man was waiting for her. And she was told to go with him. That would never happen today. The principal showed up, didn't ask any questions, <laughs> and she too agreed to send Marion on her way. They never got the man's name. I was going to say, did they check IDs? No. Nope, anything? No name. No address. Marion was just told to leave with this man. I am shaking my head. It's so unbelievable. Marion was last seen getting into a convertible roadster with a complete stranger. So if all of that wasn't strange enough, the oddest part is nobody bothered to notify Marjorie of anything. So Marjorie is staying at school having a Christmas party while supposedly her dad's been in this accident. Seriously injured calling out for only (laughs) Marion. And they don't even tell Marjorie. 
yeah, nowadays there would be some serious lawsuits going on. Oh, for sure. For sure. And someone would get fired. But I'm going to give you a spoiler. These women don't get fired. They should. In fact, the superintendent released a statement to the press on behalf of Mrs. Holt. It stated, quote, I talked to Mrs. Holt, and I'm satisfied that I would have acted as she did if I were confronted with the same circumstances. At that time, the vice principal, who is the person in authority entitled to excuse a child from class, was busy with a Christmas program and could not be reached in the few minutes that had elapsed. The fact that nothing has ever befallen our school in the past is evidence that they are as safeguarded as humanly possible. End quote. Oh. This is Mrs. Holt's fault. Yeah, you're right. I'm blaming it's her Mary. right now. Yeah, you okay, you're right. I'm blaming her right now. I don't know exactly what happens to poor Marion, well, but it's Mrs. Holt's fault. School ends and Marjorie is waiting outside for her sister to show up like she always does. Apparently they were in different classes. Their scheduled streetcar, quote unquote, that picks them up, showed up. Marjorie didn't know what to do. She didn't want to miss, you know, her ride home. So she hopped in the car. When she got home, Marion wasn't there. The family just assumed that maybe she'd stayed behind and helped the teacher clean up. That's just what they assumed. And as I said, it was Perry Parker's birthday that day, so he had been home all day. He spent it with his wife. But by 4.45, he said he started getting a little concerned, so he called the school just to check on her. And Mrs. Holt answered. Oh, Mrs. Holt's got quite the story, I bet. Yes, she does. Perry asks Mrs. Holt, hey, is Marion there? And she said, quote, she left with a man you sent to pick her up, end quote. That is just terrifying for me to say that. If I heard somebody say that, I would, my heart would be in my mouth. So Perry does what any parent would do. He hung up and he started to dial for the police. Literally, as he was calling the police, the doorbell rang. And it was a Western Union telegram delivery waiting for him on his doorstep. The telegram time stamp on it says it was sent two hours earlier around 3 p.m. The wire said, and this is a quote, do positively nothing till you receive the special delivery letter, Marion Parker, end quote. As if Marion sent it. Right. Perry and Geraldine freak out, as is appropriate at the time, and they call the police. The police arrived at their house, and they were interviewed, They stated to the police, and this is a quote, I can't understand why anyone would wish to hurt us. We live quietly, and I'm sure that I have no enemies. We are of moderate means, not the type of family, it seems to me, that would be marked by kidnappers. It's the most puzzling situation that I've ever faced, end quote. Oh, this really breaks my heart. They seem like they're nice people. They also stated, quote, Marion isn't the type of child anyone would wish to harm, end quote. While the police were at their house, a second telegram arrived, and the second telegram stated, quote, Marion secure, use good judgment, interference with my plans, dangerous, end quote. And it was signed Marion Parker and George Fox. Okay, because Marion is sending all these Western Union telegrams. <laughs> right. The Parkers didn't know a George Fox. Approximately two hours after that, another note arrived, and this one was titled Death. I'm going to read you the note. It says P.M. Parker. That stands for Perry. M. Parker. M. Parker. Thank you. (laughs) Use good judgment. You are the loser. Do this. Secure 7520 gold certificates, U.S. currency, $1,500 at once. Keep them on your person. Go about your business as usual. Oh, no problem. I'm sorry. Leave out police and detectives. Make no public notice. Keep this affair private. Make no search. Fulfilling these terms with a transfer of currency will secure the return of the girl. Failure to comply with these requests means no one will ever see the girl again except the angels in heaven. The affair must end one way or the other within three days, 72 hours. You will receive further notice, but the terms remain the same. And the salutation is fate. And then below fate, it says, if you want aid against me, ask God, not man. What a weird ass letter. 
in that envelope, there was a second letter, and it starts out, Dear Daddy and Mother. Oh, God. I wish I could come home. Oh. I think I'll die if I have to be like this much longer. Won't someone tell me why all this had to happen to me? Daddy, please do what the man tells you, or he'll kill me if you don't. Oh, my God. Your loving daughter, Marion Parker. P.S. Please, Daddy, I want to come home tonight. I would be bawling my eyes out reading this. I would have to be sedated. Seriously. And then sedated. Did she really write it? It was her handwriting. Oh. Can you imagine her writing that letter? Poor, 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 poor Marion. So the next day is Friday. And the Parkers received three phone calls on Friday with no one else on the other line. At around 8 p.m. that same day, Perry Parker answered the phone and a man actually spoke to him. And he said, I'll call back in five minutes. Okay. Okay. A half hour later, the man calls back. The man on the other end asked Parker if he had the money. And Parker responded that he did. He told Parker to leave the house immediately, go alone, and to meet him at a park. If Perry Parker were to obey those instructions, Marion would be safely returned immediately to him. So, of course, he's going to comply. Yeah, right? And he does. He follows the instructions, and he waits where he's supposed to be, and a half hour passes. Nothing happens. He waits. He waits. Hours later, around 11.45 p.m., he went back home. Oh, I would have been completely sick to my stomach. Well, when he went home, he found out that unbeknownst to him, the police had followed Perry Parker and had basically been hiding out, but apparently they were obvious enough where the kidnapper saw them. Oh, no. So that's why the kidnapper didn't do the exchange. The Parkers received another letter from the kidnappers the next day, and this one was, again, titled Death. It had an arrow pointing down to the next line, which stated, death approaching nearer each and every hour. Very, very ominous. The actual letter itself read, and I will quote it, P.M. Parker, when I asked you over the phone to give me your word of honor as a Christian and honest businessman not to try and trap or tip the police, you didn't answer. Why? Because those two closed cars carefully followed your car north on Wilton to 10th and then proceeded to circle the block on Gramercy, San Marino, Wilton, and 10th. I knew, and you knew. What for? One was a late model Buick, and the other had disc wheels. Then later, only a few minutes, I saw a yellow Buick, police car speeding toward your neighborhood. Of course you don't know any of these facts, and that is sarcasm. <laughs> I'm still in quotes with that. <laughs> Mr. Parker, I'm ashamed of you. I'm vexed and disgusted with you. With the whole damn vicinity throbbing with my terrible crime, you try and save the day by your simple police tactics. Yes, you lied and schemed to come my way only far enough to grab me and the girl too. You'll never know how you disappointed your daughter. She was eager to know that it would only be a short while and then she'd be free from my terrible torture. And then you messed the whole damn affair. Your daughter saw you, watched you work, and then drove away severely broken hearted because you couldn't have her in spite of my willingness. Merely because you, her father, wouldn't deal straight for her life. You're insane to betray your love for your daughter, to ignore my terms, to tamper with death. You remain reckless with death fast on its way. How can the newspapers get all these family and private pictures unless you give them to them? With all the quotations of your own self, Marion's twin sister, her aunt and school chums, all this continues long after you receive my strict warnings. Now keep in mind, I'm going to go off quote. This is only two days later. Jeez. But apparently, obviously, the news yeah. issued something. Probably the newspaper or something. All, you know how they are. They love dirty They laundry. love it. Yeah, they love a juicy just, story. Just like we do. Mm-hmm. Anyway, quote, all this continues long after you receive my strict warnings. Today is the last day. I mean Saturday, December 19th, year 1927. I have cut the time to two days and only one more time will I phone you. I will be two billion times as cautious, as clever, and as deadly from now on. You have brought this on yourself and you deserve it and worse. 
A man who betrays his love for his daughter is a second Judas Icariot, many times more wicked than the worst modern criminal. God, this guy. What the fuck? (laughs) If by 8 p.m. today you have not received my call, then hold a quiet funeral service at your cemetery without the body. On Sunday, the 18th, only God knows where the body of Marion Parker would rest in this event. Not much effort is needed to take her life. She may pass out before 8 p.m., so I could not afford to call you and ask you for the 1500 for a lifeless mass of flesh. Oh, nice. I am base and low, but I won't stoop to that depth, especially to an ungrateful person. Wow. When I call, if I call, I'll tell you where to go and how to go. So if you go, don't have your friends following. Pray to God for forgiveness for your mistake last night. Become honest with yourself and your blood if you don't come in this good clean honest way and be square with me that's all and it's signed fate fox then it says below fate fox if you want eight against me ask god not man i don't even know what to say to this letter it's completely turning it all on perry who already has to be so distraught if something happens to his daughter's being totally blamed yeah it's all your fault included with that narrative was a second note this one was signed by marion parker (laughs) dear daddy and mother daddy please don't bring anyone with you today i'm sorry for what happened last night we drove right by the house and i cried all last night if you don't meet us this morning you'll never see me again love to all marion parker oh that's so heartbreaking (sighs) that poor child god she's probably terrified The Parkers received yet another special delivery envelope. Is this coming from, like, the post office? Yeah. I mean, it's being hand-delivered, right? Yes. The next letter says, P.M. Parker, please recover your senses. I want your money rather than to kill your child. But so far, you've given me no alternative. Of course, you want your child, but you'll never get her by notifying the police and causing all this publicity. I feel, however, that you started to search before you received my warning. So I'm not blaming you for the bad beginning. Oh, thank you so much. Remember the three-day limit and make up for this lost time. Dismiss all authorities before it's too late. I'll give you one more chance. Get the money the way I told you and be ready to settle. I'll give you a chance to come across, and you will, or Marion dies. Be sensible and use good judgment. You can't deal with a mastermind like a common crook or kidnapper. Signed, Fox Fate. If you want aid against me, ask God, not man. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. But he's not done sending special letters. I didn't think he would be. He sends another special delivery. And I'm going to read it. This is a quote. P.M. Parker. Fox is my name. Very sly, you know. No traps. I'll watch for them. All the inside guys, even your neighbor, Isidore B., Know that when you play with fire, there is cause for burns. Get this straight. Remember that life hangs by a thread, and I have a Gillette ready and able to handle the situation. Do you want the girl or the 75 100 gold certificates, U.S. currency? You can't have both, and there's no other way out. Believe this and act accordingly. Before the day is over, I'll find out how you stand. I'm doing a solo, so figure on meeting the terms of Mr. Fox. Or else, and it's signed, Fate. If you want aid against me, ask God, not me. So before, in the other ransom letters, he had asked for 20, 75 gold certificates. And now he's asking for 75, 100 100 gold certificates. The cost is going up. They believe he actually just made a mistake. Because he's a dumbass. So our kidnapper sent one final letter to the parkers and again this is all within three days this letter is titled death final chance terms one have 1500 equals 75 dash 20 dollar gold certificates u.s currency two come alone and have no other following or knowing the place of the meeting then he wrote four bring no weapons of any kind then he wrote three (laughs) Come in the Essex coach license number 544-995. Stay in the car. 
The remainder of the letter says, if I call, your girl will still be living. When you go to the place of the meeting, you will have a chance to see her. Then without a second's hesitation, you must hand over the money. Parentheses. The slightest pause of misbehavior on your part at this moment will be tragic. End of parentheses. Seeing your daughter and transferring the currency will take only a moment. My car will then move slowly away from yours for about a block. You wait, and when I stop, I'll let the girl out. Then come and get her. Don't blunder. I have certainly done my part to warn and advise you. Signed. Do you know who signed it? Fate. Fate. Go figure. Do you know what he says at the last line? If you want aid against me, ask God. Not man. Not man. And now we're back with the story. I can't wait to hear what comes next. No. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, after the last letter, a telephone call came in to the Parker family. Perry Parker spoke to the kidnapper, told him he understood the note very clear. Because he only sent it like 10 times (laughs) with the same terms, right? Right? And then the line suddenly went dead. At about 7.15, the kidnapper called back and he told Parker the time had come. Finally. Finally. Perry Parker was to leave the house and meet the kidnapper with Marion at a place referred to as Manhattan Place. Manhattan Place is a residential neighborhood, and back in 1927, there was not any street lights, really. I mean, there were a few, but not many. So it was pretty dark. Perry Parker leaves to go and meet the kidnapper and get Marion. He waits, and about 8.15 p.m., these headlights approach, and a man pulls up next to him in a roadster vehicle convertible. The man is wearing a mask, and it covers the lower part of his face, almost like a bandit in the Western films. He brandishes a sawed-off shotgun, pointing it at Perry Parker, and says, Do you see this gun? Perry is like, Yes. Then he says, Did you bring money? Perry shows him the money and asks the kidnapper, Where's Marion? The kidnapper kind of leans back, and there is Marion on the passenger seat with a blanket over her. He really quickly lifts the blanket up so Perry can see Marion's face, but only for a second. Perry hands over the money, and the kidnapper says to Perry that I'm going to drive up a little bit, and I'm going to drop Marion off. Hold tight. A few hundred feet away, the kidnapper stops the car. Perry sees a bundle fall to the ground, and the door slams. But at this point, he's actually still elated from what he describes, because he just thinks the kidnapper pushed Marion out, uh, out of the car. So he runs up and he's calling her name and she doesn't respond. There's a blanket wrapped tightly around her and her eyes are open. And as he gets closer, he notices that the bundle seems like it's too small to be Marion. And that there's this dullness in her eyes. He thinks that her knees are maybe pulled up to her chest and she's wrapped in the blanket. Okay, I'm, I have to tell you right now, I'm really stressed out while you're telling me this. I'm, I'm, yeah, because that wasn't the case. Uh, I'm really, I'm really stressing. Like it's in the pit of my stomach. He also notices there's something wrong with her eyelashes. As he gets even closer, he whispers her name, and there's no response. You know how he thought maybe her knees were drawn up to her chest? He's wrong. Her knees are not brought up close to her chest. They are missing. Oh no. In the bundle that's supposed to be Marion is only her head and her trunk down to about an inch and a half below her belly button. Her forearms have been disarticulated. Fancy word for cut off. At the elbows. Oh my god. Okay. There were cut marks on her shoulder so they could tell that the killer had tried to maybe first dismember her by cutting her shoulder. Harry cries out in agony. Oh, Absolutely. This is horrific. The neighbors can hear his cries, and the police arrive seven minutes later. When they get there, Perry has Marion placed in his car. The police look at the body, and they notice that there is a thread fastened to each eyelid that goes around her forehead, and it it is sewed to a linen that's around her neck to keep her eyelids open. Oh, my God. Oh. Okay. 
She was wearing the dress that she wore on the day that she went missing. Randomly, there were Brazil nut shells in her dress pocket. And there was a sweater that she had also worn on that day that was buttoned up to the top. Her face had makeup on it. The killer did that to obviously make her look more lifelike. And the killer had tucked towels into her abdomen cavity. Are you fucking kidding me? No. One of the towels had a clue on it. It had the name of a hotel. Bellevue Apartments. Oh, that was smart. Their first lead. A few miles away, about the same time, a man, when he came upon four packages wrapped in newspaper, scattered along the road. Being curious, he decided to look and see what these bundles were. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I already know. Don't do it. I have a feeling. I already know. Don't do it. Don't Don't open them. Please don't. Just don't do it. Well, of course he did it. And what do you think those packages are? Marion's arms and legs. Oh... Around that same time, about 150 yards away, two boys were hiking, and they found another wrapped package and decided to check it out. And it was a truncated waist, thighs, and knees of Marion. Oh, my God. So he cut her in half, almost. Mm -hmm. Or he did cut her in half. Yeah, he did cut her in half. Like, below, right below her belly button? Yeah. So he cut her from her belly button to her knees? Yep. Oh, my God. And then her inner organs were missing, and he stuffed her... With towels. With towels. Oh, my God. This is horrific. Uh, Like, I can't even think of another word besides horrific. I keep thinking about Perry. This person should go straight to hell. On Sunday, December 18th, near Manhattan Place, where the exchange, quote-unquote, took place, a woman found a suitcase... And she opened the suitcase, and that contained a notepad that had press marks from where Marion had wrote the letter. Oh. Indentations. Okay, you know? from like the pencil or the pen or whatever? Yeah. It had two bloody newspapers, a spool of thread that matched the thread used to sew Marion's eyes open. Oh, my God. So the killer had obviously dumped that there. As you can imagine, mass hysteria took over Los Angeles in pretty much all the United States. At the same time that the police are now investigating, our killer is looking for supper. He ditches the roadster he was driving by putting in a parking lot and telling the parking lot attendant that he would come and get it on Sunday. As I stated, there was mass hysteria everywhere, and the police had a description of the kidnapper's roadster, and issued it like an APB okay. all over. Everybody in the United States is looking for that. This parking lot attendant says, hey, it's here in my parking lot. The guy who dropped it off says he's coming back on Sunday. So the police are staking out basically the roadster. They run the plates on the roadster and find out that it was actually stolen from a doctor in Kansas in November of the year before, 1926. Unbeknownst to the police... The killer has had a nice dinner and is now at the local movie theater watching a movie. Just casually dinner and a movie after he brutally murdered this little girl. Yeah, because now he's got some money. Right. Oh, my God. But he doesn't realize that the money has serial numbers on it. Oh, yeah. What a dipshit. He didn't just ask for some cash. He asked for, like, gold certificates, right? I mean, I know it's 1927, but they didn't use gold certificates as a normal currency. So he's spending the gold certificates, and in the interim, the police are getting the fingerprints off the roadster. The police get the fingerprints from the roadster, and they, I'd say, run it through their system, but I'm pretty sure they're not running it through any system. I don't know what they're doing. Probably sending it. I don't know what they did back then. By the Pony Express. By the Pony Express, right? (laughs) Somehow they get it to Kansas, and they figure out who the kidnapper slash murderer is. His name is... William Edward Hickman. Yeah, and now he's literally the most hated man in America. And I'm going to give you his bio. You're going to be surprised. I am? Yeah. William Edward Hickman was only 19 years old. Oh my God, he was only 19? Yes. He was born in 1908 to uh, William and Eva Hickman in Arkansas. He had three brothers and a sister. His dad had a lot of affairs on his wife, and she blamed those affairs for her having, quote, emotional issues. 
Uh, I'd have emotional issues too, I think, if my husband was constantly cheating on me. Yeah, except that I don't think you'd end up having to spend a year in a mental institution. Oh, probably not. By the time Hickman was one, she'd already threatened to harm her children. On more than one occasion, she'd attempted to commit suicide. So she was placed in a mental institution when he was three. She was there for a year. She eventually got out. In 1921, Eva left William's dad, and she took her kids from Arkansas to Kansas. William's childhood, I guess, was normal because I didn't hear anything weird. William went to Central High School in Kansas City. He is described as mild-mannered, popular, he got good grades, and he was elected to student council three years in a row. He is what you would call an overachiever. (laughs) It's so bizarre because he is not at all what I would have thought the person that did this to Marion would be like. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Because you're going to feel like you did nothing in school. (laughs) Okay, let's hear it. He was vice president of a senior class. He was president of the school's chapter of the National Honor Society. He was president of the Central Webster Club, which is another honor club. He was president of the Central Classics Club, which is another honor club. He was a member of the debate team. He was the business manager of the school paper. He was the literary editor of the school yearbook and voted best boy orator by his classmates. This is totally not who I would have expected. He also attended a Baptist church regularly and played on the church basketball team. He also was so nice that he had this neighbor, and it was a childhood friend, who had tuberculosis, and his neighbor was dying, and he would visit his neighbor every day. Was this like an adult neighbor? No, it was was a kid. Was it? And eventually his friend died, and he was the pallbearer. Oh. Yeah. And that was when he was, I think, a junior. I'm going to tell you what Eva, William's mom, thinks was the beginning of his downfall. As I stated earlier, William was a member of the debate team. And he helped take his team all the way to the Nationals. Ooh, exciting. He spent an entire year prepping for that competition. And when it came his time, he completely choked. Oh. He flopped. He bombed it. Oh, after all that prep. After all that prep. That is what his mom says was the catalyst to his downfall. (laughs) And it actually, believe it or not, was the start of a big change in his personality. He quit everything that he was in. Oh my God, really? Everything. He lost complete interest in his studies. He abandoned his friends. His grades tanked. And he was like, I'm a loser at debate. I'm done. (laughs) He went on and enrolled in college, but he dropped out after nine days. He got a job at the library, and at the library, he met a bad dude named Welby Hunt. Welby Hunt was 16. Hickman is 18. These two geniuses together decided to rob a candy store, and they made off with $70. In December of 1926, Hunt and Hickman decided to move to Los Angeles. Hickman told his mom he was going to try to make it in the movies. On December 5th of 1926, Hickman and Hunt decided to rob a pharmacy in Los Angeles. It was owned by a man named Ivy Tomps. They walked into the pharmacy. They had pistols and masks on. And they were like, it's a hold up. The pharmacists raised their hands up in the air. There were three customers there and they raised their hands too. But one of them was a cop. Uh oh. An off duty cop. And as he was like going to raise his hands, he pulls out a gun and they have a shooting match. Oh, you're kidding me. In the pharmacy? In the pharmacy. These two guys, these teenagers, Webley Hunt and William Hickman, they have no idea how to shoot guns. So they're firing wildly. But they actually hit the police officer in the abdomen. Oh no. He survived. Unfortunately, Ivy Tomps was shot in the chest and he died. And this is a whole year before Marion's kidnapping. So after they robbed the pharmacy in January of 1927, Hickman got a job at a bank. The bank was First National Trust and Savings. Perry Parker worked there. Yes, Perry Parker worked there. Everything was going just splendid until June of 1927 when Hickman got charged with forging checks. Perry Parker caught him forging checks. 
he was arrested. He was charged with forgery. And it's kind of funny because he lied to them about his age. So they put him in the juvenile court system. <laughs> How old did he possibly say he was? I don't know. But do they not check this information out? If he's a kid, why is he working at the bank? That's a really good point. The juvenile court system put Hickman on probation and shipped him back off to his mama's house in Kansas. While in Kansas, he got a job working as an usher in a movie theater. He absolutely loved movies, so you guys know. He was a movie buff. Oh yeah, he was going to make it in Hollywood. That's right. At some point, he moved to Pennsylvania for a few months. While he was living in Pennsylvania, someone matching his description robbed a gas station and killed the manager. A few days later... In October of 1927, Hickman moved from Pennsylvania back to Kansas. That's when he took that roadster at gunpoint from a doctor. And then he drove that roadster to Los Angeles and rented an apartment in Bellevue Apartments. This is November of 1927, a few weeks before Marion's kidnapping. While in Los Angeles, he robbed a pharmacy on Sunset Boulevard. He was looking for chloroform and ether oh i didn't even know pharmacies had chloroform or ether or that ether. Matter. he ended up robbing a total of two pharmacies he got some sleeping pills and 80 dollars. while in los angeles he met a couple and he told them that he was planning on kidnapping a child to get some quote real money end quote so that is my brief rundown of william hickman So the police now know who their man is, but they don't know where he is. And that's when they start the investigation. As I stated earlier, the towel found in Marion's abdomen cavity had Bellevue Arms Apartments on it. So the police went to Bellevue Arms Apartments and interviewed some of the tenants there. They found out that on Saturday night, one of the tenants, whose name was Donald Evans, which is actually a fake name for William Hickman, was seen carrying a suitcase with some other bundles out to his car. He was the tenant in apartment 315. So they went inside apartment 315 and they found some broken Brazil nut shells that matched the broken shells in Marion's pockets. The mass hysteria that had spread over the nation had everybody and their mother looking for William Hickman. In looking at the rest of the apartment, there's a lot of evidence that Hickman was there and Marion was there. You could tell he cleaned up the apartment and he had taken his stuff and obviously was not coming back to that place. And Hickman knows he can't come back to that place either and he is on the run. He's stolen another car at gunpoint and he is doing a little road trip. With his gold certificates. With serial numbers on him. The world in 1927 looking for William Hickman is a lot different than the world looking for someone nowadays. We have the internet, so you can actually see what the person looks like and their face. That's true. Instead of a description. A lot of people were misidentified as William Hickman. One guy was arrested five times. Oh, no. (laughs) In a matter of a couple days. Oh, this poor man. He was eventually given an exemption pass. (laughs) So you just flash it? We would just flash it. (laughs) Yes. So many people were getting arrested for being William Hickman that they gave out exemption passes that you could flash, letting a police officer know, do not arrest me. One man was arrested for robbery, and as he was walking through the jail, someone yelled out, that's William Hickman. That night, that guy was beaten to death. Oh, no. The police keep searching and searching for William Hickman. And on Wednesday, a few days after the murder, a letter was given to the Seattle Sheriff's Department. Do you know who likes to write letters? I know. I was just going to say another fucking letter. Okay. (laughs) Yes. The letter reads, quote, I'm tired of this. Would I be given fair play if I surrender? I did not intend on killing Marion. I didn't mean to harm her. I only wanted to put her to sleep. Oh, stop this. You cut her in half. I did not want her to suffer as she was a good girl. She was not afraid of me at any time and did not suffer. She only wanted to go home and would have left safely if my plans had not failed. Will this make any difference? This is the truth. The fox. 
This letter is so stupid. It didn't take long for the police to catch Hickman because of the spending of the gold certificates. Oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) At one point, he went and bought thermal underwear, a hat, and gloves because Seattle was much colder than L.A., and they were able to trace gold certificates. He gave them, like, a little two-minute chase, but then he pulled over the side of the road. The police arrest Hickman. He's not in Seattle, but he is in that general area, and they have to ship him back to L.A. to face the consequences. Hickman doesn't confess to the police, but he does reach out to a reporter while he is in jail in L.A. to give his side of the story. He tells the reporter this quote-unquote confession, but he's got a couple, okay? Okay. He states, quote, I happen to remember that Mr. Parker had a daughter, and he would take her downtown and buy her lunch, and she was around the bank like she was a big man. Such an asshole. I know. 12 year old little girl. Okay. So that's the first quote. And then he goes on to explain how he watched the Parker house for a few days. And on Thursday morning, the day that Marion was kidnapped, he parked by their house and watched them get into their streetcar for school. So he stalked them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He tells a reporter that after he took Marion, she was really worried about her dad. But for the most part, they spent their time talking about movies and favorite comic strips. And he said, quote, I really kind of liked her. I could not look her in the face when I told her she was kidnapped. Then he goes on to say, when I told her nothing had happened to her father, she didn't worry or scream. She was calm as can be. He then said that he took her to the movies. They laughed a lot. He claimed to the reporter that he gave her to an accomplice for the night. And he didn't see her until the next day. When he saw her the next day, she begged him to let her stay with him because he was so much nicer to her than the unknown accomplice. Stop it. He's he's a sweetheart. He said his accomplice scared him too. He was so scared of his accomplice that he told Marion, I just, I can't have you stay with me. This guy controls the scene, not me. The next day... The accomplice came over with a suitcase and her body was in pieces. Oh, stop it. Mm -hmm. So he didn't do it. One One me. One me. He said, quote, I am terribly sorry she was killed because I sure liked her. End quote. Of course, there's going to be a trial for William Hickman. And he gets a court-appointed attorney named Jerome Walsh. His attorney came up with a strategy of using the insanity plea as a defense for Hickman because his attorney really, truly believed In order for anybody to do this crime, they had to be insane. In Chicago at the time, or a little bit earlier, Leopold and Loeb, those two famous young guys who thought they were smart enough to get away with murder, tried the insanity defense too, and it just became legal in California. So Hickman is like, oh, I'm fucking nuts. And his story changes again, and there's no accomplice. It's him this time. Oh, okay. Yes, because you can't plead insanity if you didn't do the crime. Right. Right? And in California, if you plead insane, you have to admit... That you're guilty? That you're guilty. Yeah, so the only way out of it is if they deem him to be insane. And if he was deemed insane, and he later became sane, he could be released. Hickman's attorney had him meet with a psychiatrist to evaluate to see if he had mental illness. The psychiatrist's report stated, quote, There was nothing about him to indicate insanity. He says that he does not like girls, that he's deeply religious, and his ambition is to become a minister. Several times he made mention of God, and in discussing his capture, took the attitude that since God willed it, it had to be. Stop it. Stop it. When Hickman received the news that the prosecutors were officially pursuing the death penalty, he attempted to commit suicide. His first attempt consisted of him jumping headfirst off the top bunk of his bed onto the floor. That resulted in him getting a headache. (laughs) For the second attempt, he put a handkerchief around his neck and tried to hang himself from a beam. The guards heard him moaning, rushed in, cut him down, and he lived. There is some irony in trying to avoid the gallows by hanging yourself. Eventually, Hickman made a full confession to his attorneys. And one of his attorneys actually wrote a book about it. Do you want to know what he said? Yep. 
Okay. I sure do. This is, according to the murderer, what happened to Marion. As you know, he took her from school. They drove around. And he told Marion that she'd been kidnapped, but that she'd be released in a day or two after getting the 1500 from her father. Like he said before, he stated that Marion didn't cry. She didn't fight. But she did request that he not tie her up or blindfold her. Hickman showed her the gun. She promised to behave. And he said, quote, We talked and had a jolly time. Marion said she liked to go driving, and she went so far as to relate to me that she had a dream just a few days before that someone called her at school and in reality kidnapped her. What? Really? That's true. Is that true? Yeah, she did. She told other people that. Wow. He further stated it was very nice to hear her, and I could see that she believed and trusted me for her safety. End quote. So on the first night, Thursday, he took her to see a film, and they laughed a lot. Oh, yeah, hilarious. I'm yucking it up with my kidnapper, but okay. Well, I do believe that she... Thinks she's going home. She, yeah, thinks she's going home. She fell asleep on the couch around 7 o'clock. The next morning, Marion started crying and was visibly upset. So to console her, he had her write a letter to her parents. He went to go mail the letters, and he left Marion tied up at the apartment. When he got back to the apartment, he untied her. They drove around some more. And he started getting paranoid that people were recognizing her. That night was a night that he was supposed to drop Marion off and get the ransom money. But the police, you know, foiled that attempt. Hickman, as you recall, was very upset that the police were following Perry. Yeah, he chewed out Perry in his letters. Yeah, repeatedly. Hickman was still upset the next morning. This is Saturday morning. And when Marion woke up, she was crying and hysterical. According to Hickman, she was frightened, confused. And she started becoming troublesome. She refused to eat and she spent the entire day crying to the point that she fell asleep from exhaustion. Aww. While she was sleeping, Hickman picked up her sleeping body and he put her on her chair and he tied her. Because anybody that has kids knows when they're little, you can pick them up when they're sleeping and they don't wake up. Well, she did wake up when he shoved a handkerchief in her mouth. He tied it with a dish towel and he left her bound, gagged, and blindfolded while he went out to mail some more letters. When he returned, she was screaming through the gag and struggling to breathe. According to Hickman, her eyes were wide with terror. Is this happening in his apartment? Yes. Okay. He told his lawyers when he saw her eyes, he immediately felt remorse. But he really wanted the ransom so he could go to college and become a minister. He prayed to God for guidance. A lot of thoughts were going through his head. He says, quote, At this moment, my intention to murder completely gripped me. End quote. He untied the dish towel and removed the gag. Marion was actually relieved. She thought at this point he was freeing her. He then grabbed the dish towel and mumbled something to Marion about, here, let's rest your neck with the dish towel. And then he put her on her neck and he strangled her with all of his strength. Oh. She was gasping for air. Her body was thrashing about. And then eventually she slumped over. He stared at her lifeless body until the sun came up. Then he decided to go to the store and get some makeup to make her look more lifelike. When he got home, he started thinking, how am I going to get her out of my apartment? And he saw a suitcase and he thought, I need to make her fit. He untied her and he moved her to the bathtub where he removed her clothes. This is going to get graphic. It's going to be about 20 seconds. He tied towel strips around her ankles and hoisted her body up over the drain using the towel rack. Oh. As her body was hanging there, he remembered how he once worked at a poultry farm. At the poultry farm, he disemboweled and disjointed the chickens. He decided that would be a great idea to do to Marion. He turned on the bathwater and he watched her blood go down the drain. Then he went to the kitchen to have a snack. He let he her just body let her drain. Yes, he let her drain. Mm. When he came back, when he came back, he decided to disembowel her. When he opened her abdomen up, the smell was so awful that he vomited. He then washed her torso and cut through her backbone. When he cut through her backbone, her body started jerking all oh around and God. jerked itself out of the bathtub. Oh my God. He had to wrap her head and cradle it, quote unquote, so it wouldn't become detached. He picked her up out of the bathtub dressed her, put the makeup on, sewed her eyelids open, brushed and styled her hair, he put a bow on it. Oh, Jesus! And they went to meet Perry Parker. 
Hickman's trial started on January 25th, 1928. Over 1,000 people showed up. If they had TVs back then, this would have been the trial of the century on TV. Hickman stood before the court and made his confession because, as you know, you have to confess to the crime if you're going to use the insanity defense. He confessed to the court and then his attorneys pled not guilty by reason of insanity. The court determined that he was aware of right and wrong when he committed the act and he was deemed to be sane. Therefore, he was sentenced to To death. death. Hickman himself told people, quote, I do not believe I'm insane but I am different from other people, end quote. Hickman spent a lot of time with his attorneys, and he did tell them about a voice that would talk to him. This was some powerful voice that guided him. It was a secret he had. Only he could hear the voice. Basically, he was the chosen one. Why didn't he bring that up? Well, I'm not sure if it was just bullshit Mm. to make him seem insane or if it was real. It's convenient that he's telling his his attorneys it was a secret before. But then again, he could have been insane and that could have been happening. But people didn't think so. On October 18th, 1928, at 9.50 a.m., Hickman was led to the gallows. He climbed the 13 stairs and at the top he passed out. That did not stop the hangman. They put the noose around him anyway and released the trap door and Hickman was hanged. As for Perry Parker, he spent the next 16 years trying to find some sort of normalcy for his family. That was his goal. He died in 1944 at the age of 57. His wife, Geraldine, died in 1963 at the age of 75. Marjorie got married, had a family, and died in 1981 at the age of 71. Also, I wanted to let everybody know my sources. I got most of my information from a book written by Troy Taylor called I Want to Come Home Tonight, The Haunting Story of Marion Parker. And also, if you want to get more episodes, such as the Bass City Massacre, which also occurred in 1927, if you become a member, you can get extra episodes. AMAs. um, Mini episodes. Mini episodes. Early releases. Just check it out. Lots of good stuff. Lots Lots, of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. So do you want to tell everybody how they can find us? Absolutely. As Talia mentioned, you can find us on our website, tntcrimes.com. Well, thank you, Talia. You're so welcome. Thank you, Tanya, for being such a great audience. (laughs) And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Until next week. Until next week. Mm -hmm.